Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to this little video. Um, I did mention I would much rather have had a few hours with you all in person um, to walk through this and make sure that we're all on the same page and give you the opportunity for questions and what have you with the time frame that <laughs> I had and that we've all got um, to change the way that we're doing things at the coaching sessions um, for little A's, that just was never gonna be possible with everybody's diary. So our plan B is this, um, a little video for you. And of course, if you have any questions that come out of this, please don't hesitate to um, either give me a buzz or shoot me a message on our WhatsApp chat. Okay, so the aims for our little session today are uh, three things, and I always think you, I've, I've got a, a, a long history in learning and development, and whenever I'm planning a session, I like to think in terms of three things. What do I want my my participants to, how do I want them to be different when, when the session's over? I want you to know your role and my role, um, what's required of you, the structure and approach to the coaching this season, um, and a few tips for two things, the process of learning and the language of learning. Um, Secondly, I want you to feel confident in what you're doing and what's required and keen to get going. I actually think we're going to probably have a lot of fun this season. And thirdly, um, is what I want you to do is to be able to implement the approach um, with special emphasis on this my one thing. So that's the purpose of getting together virtually in a way today. To start with, here's what we're going to cover. So we're gonna have a look at my role um, and your role. We'll have a look at the goals that we have for the training sessions that you're gonna be doing, um, how they're structured, which are a little bit different for the B&B, the beginners and basics versus technical training. Um, we're gonna have a look at the process of learning a new skill and the language of learning. Those two things are informed by my background. I have a, a long professional background in human resources, learning and development. I've been a human resources director. I've spent um, so many hours of my life doing coaching in another context, executive coaching. I've taught coaches um, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a real learner myself as well. Um, I took up master's athletics 11 years ago um, and have, you know, learnt numerous events. I've been world champion in the heptathlon. I've um, gone from never having run the 400 hurdles, which is the most technical event on the track, to being world champion in it 18 months later. Um, I'm, I'm an avid and deliberate learner and I love learning. Um, and I've, I've, you know, part of my career has been spent helping people do that. So um, I've done a lot of leadership development work as well. So um, helping people learn is something that I've done a lot of. Learning myself is something I've done a lot of. Um, and I, I love it. So um, I'm just going to share a few tips with you for our context on those two things. And then the, at the very end, um, the B&B coaches will be able to sign off. And then there's just a, a, another couple of minutes that I want to spend um, giving the technical training coaches a little overview of the first night, which will be different to sort of ongoing. Okay, so our roles. Um, for you as coaches, the key thing I want you to focus on is an improvement for every athlete, at least one. Obviously, that will differ among athletes and among events, but if you can have as your North Star, every athlete has improved perceptively on at least one thing that they know well enough to have a go at doing that in a competition. That's our key thing. Um, in the course of doing that, I want you all to be able to implement and help improve and refine this approach. It's quite a different approach to what Little A's has done in the past. It used to be kids would come, they'd do one session on an event, and then the next week they'd go off and do something else. Sometimes halfway through the session, they'd run off and do something else. And this was not particular. It was, it was fun as a coach, but it wasn't particularly satisfying because you can't teach kids any technical skill in one and a half hours and expect that they're gonna implement that in a competitive situation. They'll do what they've practiced the most. And if they've only come for one session and not repeated it, um, they're not gonna do it when, when they get to a competition. So it's a big shift. The parents are, I think, a bit nervous about it because their kids are not gonna train in everything before zone. Um, but 
what I'm asking them to do, and I'll share this communication with you, is to shift their thinking away from doing a training session to improving their competence. And when you have the same group of kids for four weeks, and as you know, it's with the technical training, obviously I'm talking about even the B&B training, it used to be three events in one night, and then the next week they'd do another three events. So you're now doing two events in one night and you're repeating that two events the following week. So there's also opportunity to um, reinforce and um, improve what, you know, actually have a shot at kids learning those really basics, basic things. Um, so yeah, the, w what, um, what we will find is that we will actually be able to produce some improvement um, in four weeks compared to one week. And I think once the, the parents sort of see that and they can shift their thinking away from doing a training session before zone to actually choosing one or two events before zone and improving perceptively in that in those two events. Um, and then you know they'll get an opportunity to choose others as we go on past zone. So um, I think there's going to be some some um, some changes and I'm I'm really confident that they're going to be good. So I, because it's a new thing, though, um, I need you all to be really active in helping um, implement it, make it work on the ground. You know, it's one thing to have a, an idea. It's another to make it work in practice. And that's where you all come in. So feedback, um, if we need to tweak things, we can tweak them. Um, I really need you to be engaged and, and active um, in terms of helping make this approach work. Um, and, and you know, tweaking it, refining it as we go. Um, and then the third thing in terms of your role is to ensure your group is full. So we don't want any empty spots because we're limiting the, the group numbers. Um, and as you know, you know, um, the, the Monday night T, TT coaches have all given me the number that they think is the, the biggest number of athletes they can deal with and actually teach them something. Um, so because we're limiting that, there's probably going to be people who wanted to come to your session this month, but they can't. Um, if for whatever reason somebody you know, is sick, um, some emergency, they can't come, and you know you're going to ha have a uh, – they're being asked to do, give you at least 24 hours notice, if not more, um, then – you know, fill it with somebody who's on who's on the waiting list. Even you know, they might be doing your event next block, but they if they can have a session now and then come and do your event next block, next block, even better. That means they get five weeks on your event. So um, so please try and make sure there's there's you've got a full group every time. In terms of my role, obviously designing a program that works, and I really believe you know this will this will work. Obviously, they're not going to be um, fully proficient in each event with just four weeks, but I do think four weeks is enough for them to um, to gather some proficiency. And with the Wednesday nights, because the what they're learning is so basic, I do think that we'll be able to lock in some, some basics um, just by repeating it a couple of times and, and having a little bit more time on each event. So... That's my gig, is designing the program that works. And from feedback with you, you know, we'll, we'll tweak that as we go. Um, Organise the implementation, obviously. <laughs> I started with no coaches locked in, not even a, a contact list um, of phone numbers or anything. So it's been a bit crazy. Um, but obviously, we've, we've got you all now, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, it's my job to, you know, just try and make it all happen. Um, my job is also to support you. So if there's anything you need, if you have questions, if you want to bounce something off of me, if we're at a session and you've got a parent harassing you to include another kid and they're not going, not taking your your response and leaving, um, you know, send them to me. I'm there to support you. Um, if you need a hand with with some activity that you're you're doing and you'd like a second pair of eyes on it, give me a hoy. I'll come and help. Um, so I'm there to support you. You're there to support the athletes. And obviously, I'm here to coordinate with the with the Little A's committee and executive um, on all of this. So what's required of you? Number one, commitment to your group. So because you're going to have the same athletes for four weeks, um, I need you to take ownership of that. That is your group. 
for that training block. So that means reliable attendance. You, you need to turn up or your group's going to be standing around with nothing to do and no one to lead them. Um, last year, Pearl Ryan was coordinating coaches and he would sometimes get coaches texting him an hour before training was about to start saying, oh, I'm not coming today. That's not okay. Um, you know, we've got parents and kids who, you know, arrange their day so that they'd be there. They're hoping that they're going to um, get some skills improvement. Um, we've organised them and said, come, you know, we're changing it. There's going to be four-week blocks, so we need to make sure that we are there reliably. Um, and secondly, um, the other commitment I think is important to point out here is remembering safety for your kids, which some events are more, you know, tricky than others on that. Um, but just remember, you know, safety first, do no harm like the doctors. First, do no harm. Um, secondly is to provide your athletes with three things. And those three things are the same three things, but they are a slightly different priority depending whether you're a B&B or a TT coach. Um, I know some of you are both, but so bear in mind the slight change in emphasis depending on whether which training session you're running. So with our B&B, our beginners and basics training, um, the order of priority is fun, encouragement and learning. We definitely do want them to learn, which is why we've changed it to a bit of repetition. Um, but as much as anything, the focus is on fun and encouragement with them as well. And they're often younger, um, although not exclusively. Um, with the technical training, just a bit of reverse order there. Learning is more important here. We're asking them to focus for four weeks on one thing. So we do need more of a focus on the learning aspect um, than we've had in the past and then, then um, would be the case on the Wednesday nights. Um, but obviously still encouragement and fun. And with the fun, I mean, you know how to have fun. You know, have a laugh with the kids. It, it, they're hilarious. Um, uh, I think using their names is important too, which is a bit hard for the B&B coaches because you might have a zillion kids um, and they, you know, they'll be changing every two weeks. So you may not be able to get their names down pat. But I think for the technical training coaches, um, this is why I'm going to give you name tags and, and name stickers in the first week and, and what have you, um, is that make it make it fun for the kids and, you know, ha engage with them personally, have a laugh. It's it's all part of it. Um, the encouragement and the learning part, I'll focus on a little bit more um, further down in the presentation, but in terms of fun, you know, you know what that is. Um, What's required of you? Uh, responsive communication. I know I'm banging on about this, and most of you have been fantastic on this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but when I put up questions or I need information from you or I need your feedback, please get back to me quickly um, because you know that will be one of 20 things I'm doing. So I, you know, having to follow up and chase up um, people for answers to questions that I've already asked. Um, it, it just it does my head in. So that is, um, I ask that sort of support from you to me. Um, role model and learning attitude. Um, the best, the best teachers are people who are great learners. I don't know if any of you are on the on the mailing list for Altis, A L T I S. It's one of the preeminent athletic training facilities in the world. It's based in the US. My coach actually works there. And they, they share some terrific stuff on a weekly basis about coaching. They, they train coaches as well as athletes. And one of the things that really comes through from their emails is how these coaches, so these are professional coaches who, I mean, my coach coached Aries Merritt, who broke the world record in the sprint hurdles 10 years ago, and his record still stands. Um, so these are top level coaches, Olympic world champion, you know, level athletes, and they are constantly talking about what they're learning and questioning their own knowledge, you know, making sure they don't get stuck in their ways. Um, they're constantly learning themselves as coaches as well as helping their athletes learn. And so what I want from us is to role model that attitude. You know, we're, we're encouraging this stack of kids to be learning um, which means having the courage to have a go and get it wrong. doesn't matter. Okay, what do we learn? What do we do differently next time? Good stuff. Um, we need to be role modelling that ourselves. So if you try something in a session and it doesn't work or it doesn't work as well as you thought it would, okay, hmm, that didn't quite work the way I thought it would. Let's try something different. What can we do differently, um, for example? 
um, I'll be offering some ideas as I come around um, if there are things that I think might be helpful for you. So that openness to feedback that, you know, don't expect yourself to get it right all the time. Don't expect yourself to be the world's biggest expert on anything. To be a great teacher, you need to be a great learner. And it's important for us to role model that attitude. Um, and lastly, ask for help. If you need it, um, I'm here. If you need something out at a, a training session, I'm here. Heather's there on the Wednesday nights. Um, you know, pick up the phone, shoot me a message on WhatsApp. Um, let me know. There's there's a whole stack of you, and there's only one of me, so I may not you know pick up what you what you need because my head might be in 15 other places. Um, so if you do need help, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm trying to obviously furnish you with um, some some tools and resources that'll be useful along the way. But if there's if there's something particular you need or you want to just you know run something past me or whatever, please feel free. Okay, so structure of the sessions, a little bit different on the BMB and the technical training. So um, Wednesday nights are now going to be two events per night and repeat it the second week. So it used to be three events per night and then the next week they'd do another three events. It's now going to be only two events per night, so a little bit more time spent on each one and then repeating that those two events the following week so that kids can, there's a little bit of that repetition, which we're going to talk about how important that is to learning. Um, and uh, and so that by the time they might turn up or in, register for a technical training session, they at least know how to hold the shot put or um, you know uh, measure a run up for long jump or even maybe jump into the long jump pit off one leg. You know that might be the basic confidence that they they need. So um, so that's the beginners and basics, focusing on really elementary competencies and maybe in some cases the rules if the kids don't know the rules. Um, and Heather will do what she did last week. She'll send you the little running sheet for each week um, for the BMB coaches. And it, it'll basically be just your job to, to follow that and implement it. And um, uh, yeah, help the kids get as much out of it as they can. For the Monday night sessions, the technical training, um, where, as you know, we're going to be focusing on your event for four weeks with the same same bunch of kids. Um, I've given you on the coaching cards the the generic session outlines, and you you need to obviously you're all you're all coaches. You don't need me to tell you you know give you the exact activities to do, um, but you you decide on that detail. Um, but it's the overall structure of the sessions that I'd like you to follow. Um, especially around beginning and ending all the time with their one thing. Um, it's a really good um, approach to take. There's a, a trainer's tip, which goes like this. Tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. And that really helps people learn. It puts a, a kind of structure around their learning. Okay, what I'm going to learn is A, B, C. Oh, here I am learning A, B, and C. What did I just learn? I learned A, B, C. Feel free to, to, to do that in your sessions. Okay, tonight we're going to focus on the run-up in high jump and measuring that out so that you know how to do it. Um, then you run your session and then you finish the session on. So tonight... We focused on the run up in high jump. Last week, we did whatever, you know, the takeoff. Um, this week, we focused on, on measuring the, the, the run up. Um, time to go. What's your one thing, Johnny? What's your one thing, Mary? Da 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 da. So you might just bookend your sessions by reminding them what they've learnt and reminding what their one thing is. Um, the one thing I would just suggest to our technical training coaches is that if you've got things that are performed really quickly, so like starts, for instance, um, start introducing that early in the four-week four block so that you can do a little bit of repetition each week. And the reason for that, I'll, I'll spend a little time talking about that in a second. Okay, so I said we were going to focus on two things. Um, the process of learning a new skill and the language of learning. So a little bit of input for you guys. And what I would suggest, some of this you guys will know. 
you might already be doing a bunch of these and maybe there's some things you're not. So I'd suggest you maybe take one thing from this, uh, these two topics and uh, something that maybe is new to you or that you think, hmm, I'm not doing that as, as often or as well as I could. Maybe I'll focus on that um, and implement that in your own sessions. So the two topics, process of learning a new skill and language of learning. So the first one, process of learning a new skill. I'm going to walk through three things. So the one, the, this reason for this focus on my one thing, and it comes down to our attentional bandwidth and, and the problem that speed, any action that's performed at speed poses for that bandwidth. And, and that's going to explain why we're focusing on the one thing. Um, I'm going to suggest you involve them as much as possible in the learning process by using questions and getting them to own their own one thing. And thirdly, um, a couple of uh, tips for when they're struggling, what to do. So let's have a look at this bandwidth thing. So the reason that I am really wanting us to focus each kid on what their one thing is, is that our attention is like the NBN cable that's coming into your home. There are only so many bits per second that can stream up and down. There's only so much that our minds can process in any given second. So when we have to perform something really fast, and let's remember some of the things that we are asking these kids to do are performed really fast. So for example, my sprint hurdles. I aim to do to get from the landing of one hurdle to the landing of the next hurdle in under 1.1 seconds. Right, there's a whole bunch of things that happen in that 1.1 second. Starts very fast from that set position to you know the first few strides. That happens so fast. So when we've got a lot to do within a small space of time, let's even just take a second, we can only focus on one thing. And to the next point on the slide here, less is more. Because if you give me only one thing, I can focus on it, I can have some success with it, I can master it, I can repeat it, it can become automatic. If you give me more, and I've said here more is less, I am going to not be able to focus on anything because I'm trying to think of too many things, <coughs> excuse me, all at once. I'm not going to master anything. I'm not going to remember what it is I learned because there was there were too many, there's too many competing, um, too much competing information for that limited bandwidth. And I'm going to walk away with much less, if anything, than if you'd only given me one thing. So your challenge as a coach, and, and I really put this out to you very seriously as a challenge, because it is hard, is because as a coach, when you know what you're doing, you'll be watching a kid have a go at, at, at a repetition of something, and you might see three, four, five, six, eight, ten things they're doing wrong. Ten things that if they improved them, they could run faster, jump higher, jump longer, throw better, walk better. Your, your the value you're adding as a coach is to select in that moment what's the one thing out of those 10 that will make the biggest difference to this kid right now and ignore the other nine, or I've said here the other 10 for now. As much as you want them to improve on all of them, it's your challenge to ignore all the other things but that one thing that is, that is going to make the biggest difference to that kid right now. And that can, as I say, it can be hard because sometimes you can see a lot of things. Just don't do it. Only one at a time. So then what that allows them to do is repeat with their focus on that one thing, with that limited bandwidth, attention focused on that one thing. We repeat it and we repeat it. The little neurons start building and firing and repeating. And next thing we know, they're doing it without us having to remind them. So repetition bakes it in. Repetition bakes it in. Repetition is a hugely important part of learning. And that's what they were just getting none of or very little of when they were only turning up for one session or half a session. 
So um, repetition bakes it in one thing at a time so that they know what it is they're repeating. And I would suggest to you, and I can see that my writing is a little bit, um, you probably can't quite see it. Uh, I've suggested here start and finish every session with their one thing. And for those who, you know, maybe even start by asking who competed on the weekend. Because remember, these, a lot of these kids will be out on a Saturday um, doing their little A's competitions. So they might be doing the event that you're training them in on the Saturday. So who competed on the weekend? Okay. Did you remember your one thing? Yes, no. How did you go with your one thing? Oh, I forgot it. Or I'm not sure. Or, you know, mum said I... I didn't do it or <laughs> whatever. It doesn't matter. Repetition, repetition, repetition. They'll, they'll eventually get it. End each session the same way. Right. Oh, what we've, what we've covered today is learning how to do your long jump run up or your high jump run up or whatever it is. Posture, posture up tall in sprinting. Um, what, what, what's our one thing? Everybody, before we go, you know, Mary, Jim, Isaac, Kate, Get them to name it because what I'm going to be doing is suggesting to the parents that when they're driving them home, that they ask their kid what's their one thing. That when they watch them compete on Saturday, they remind them, what's your one thing, Johnny? That once they've had their little race or their jump or their throw or their walk, what, how'd you go with your one thing? And then maybe give them feedback on what they saw from their one thing. So really important that we meet this challenge to not give them any more than one at a time. Realistically, because you're presenting a new competency each week, you might even present more than one if they're really simple and easy. Um, you know, they are learning more than one thing each week. But what I want you to do is to focus their attention all the way through when they do, you know, so let's say their one thing is um, hands hip to lip. Right, so that they're using, you know, they might might have been using their hands down here, and we're saying, okay, hip to lip, hip to lip. That might be their one thing. You might be teaching them starts, or you might be teaching them posture this week, or whatever. But even while they're doing their reps on posture, you might suggest to them at the end of a rep, um, how'd you go on your one thing? Oh no, I forgot my arms hip to lip. I forgot my hands hip to lip. So just you can build that in to what you're doing um, with the competencies that you're teaching them. So repetition bakes it in. Your challenge is <laughs> to stick to one thing at a time, at least the thing that we're going to call their one thing until they've mastered it, until they're doing it without you having to remind them. Um, and then you can switch to a new one thing because bandwidth is limited. Um, you give them any more, they're going to walk away with less. So less is more, more is less. So that's our one thing. Um, the second thing in terms of the process is involving them in the learning process. And the one thing that I want to you know, suggest as your takeaway on this is just to use questions as much as you can, as opposed to statements and telling. There's a role for statements and telling as well. If you're giving your feedback or if you're giving instructions or whatever, there's obviously a role for it. But when you're, when, when you're assessing how they're going on, a, on an attempt, as much as possible, ask first. So, so when they're about to do it, it's a good idea. And I, I have firsthand experience of this. I had to do it with my hurdlers last year because I'd have different kids at different, you know, completely different strengths and weaknesses, different size hurdles, different ages, what have you. And, and, and it's really technical. So I'm, you know, having to sift through what they're doing for what, what is the most important thing to focus this kid on right now, communicate that to them in a way that they understand. Obviously, taking feedback from them, you know, you're, you're gauging, are they getting it, are they not, um, and and dealing with that. And then next thing, boom, you're on to the next kid who's waiting to have their go on the start line. Um, so I can't remember if I've got eight kids, I can't always switch quickly enough from what I've just talked about with athlete A or athlete six um, to what did I say five minutes ago to athlete seven who's about to leave the start line now? So you, this is where we need them to to own it. So ask them, okay, what's your one thing? Uh, just remind me, what's your one thing? Oh, I've got to run first, fast to the first hurdle. Awesome, off we go. They can do it. I had kids, you know, 
I had eight-year-olds. I think I even had a few seven-year-olds because it was just chaos last year. Um, and they, they can do this. Don't think because they're young kids they can't do it. They can. You give them their one thing and, and, and tell them you need them to remember the one thing. It's their one thing. Okay, so before they go, what's your one thing, Johnny? Okay, what are you, what are you trying to do on this one? Um, so get them to self-assess once they've done it. How'd you go? What, how did that one go? What did you think of that one? Um, and what you're doing is helping them build the mindfulness of their body and what they're doing. Some kids will have no idea. Some kids will have no awareness of their body and what they just did. And that's okay. Um, in that case, what we want to do is start encouraging them to pay attention. So, okay, let's do it again. And I want you to pay attention to what you're doing um, because we want you to be able to repeat it. So you need to know what it is you're doing so you can repeat it next time. So just pay attention. How does it feel? What are you doing? What are you, what are you getting your body to do as you, as you have a go? Um, I've said there, allow silence. Sometimes you'll ask, some kids will be really forthcoming with this and they'll be able to answer and articulate easily. Others will, might give you a bit of a, I don't know, or not sure, or maybe even don't answer. Don't jump in, use silence. If they don't answer, give them a few seconds. Ask another question to encourage them. So do you remember anything about the about what you did with your body, with your arms, with your legs? If the answer's no, that's okay. Just encourage them to pay attention next time. And again, I've just see I've um, cut it off with the, where the little video appears, but um, a great question um, at the end of a little assessment, if you've asked them to, to assess how they're going is, okay, so what are you gonna try and do differently next time? Okay, next time I'm going to uh, lean forward at the start rather than back. Okay, awesome. So just so my one one thing on involving them in the learning process is um, using questions as much as possible. Uh, now, third thing um, on on the process of learning a new skill. Um, so the first thing was about limited bandwidth and focusing on the one thing. Second thing is involving them in the learning process, um, using questions uh, and actually getting them to own their one thing as part of that as well. Um, and then the third thing is what to do if kids are struggling. First thing is slow down the action that you're asking them to perform. So just so that there is less happening in that, there is less they're having to pay attention to in that one second of bandwidth. So, as I said, you know, between landing, you know, on hurdle one and landing on hurdle two, 1.1 seconds, there's a hell of a lot that happens in that 1.1 seconds. If I can slow that down um, and say, okay, let's, let's do five steps between hurdles instead of three. Slow it down. I want a slow run in just slow, you know, just gentle and slow between hurdles so that we can focus on bringing the lead knee up towards the chest or you know, whatever it might be. So slow it down. And then if that's still not working, break it down and only do part of the action. So um, I might in that scenario with the hurdles I just um, used, I might get a baby hurdle and I might get them to just take one step and then lift the knee. Because a lot of the times what, what kids do, what I used to do when I first took up hurdles, um, was with their lead leg, they'll have this straight leg out there, in pointed toe and straight leg over the, over the hurdle. And we don't want that. We want, a, we want a slightly bent leg with a dorsiflex toe. So if that's what if we're trying to get them away from the straight leg with a pointed toe towards a bent leg with a dorsiflex foot, um, then I might, you know, just, just you know, one slow one slow step to the baby hurdle, and then I want you to lift that knee to the chest, and I want I want you to show the sole of your foot to the front of the hurdle. Okay, just slowly, just one part, not the so breaking it down from three fast strides, raising the the lead knee, bringing around the trail knee fast, bringing not not putting it down until you've got that second knee in front of you. Right, get a slice of it just the knee coming towards the chest, just the lead knee coming towards the chest. Let's just practice that. And we're going to practice, and, or I've said thirdly there, um, you can do both. You can slow it down and break it down to just a slice. 
of the action that you're asking them to do. Again, many of you probably do this intuitively anyway, but just, you know, we've got a variety of experience in the group. And so um, I just wanted to share that with you in terms of a principle when kids, when kids are struggling. So in terms of the process, we've covered three things. My one thing, because we only have so much bandwidth, especially when we're doing things fast. Um, two, involve them in the learning process by using questions and getting them to own their one thing. And thirdly, um, if they're struggling, slow it down and break it down. Can you see what I've done here? I told you what I was going to tell you, and then I told you, and then now I'm telling you what I told you. So you might want to use that in your sessions. Okay, tonight we're going to focus on um, uh, I've got too many ideas in my head. Uh, I'll go with the ones I'm familiar with. Tonight we're going to focus on uh, using power down into the ground um, for sprinting. And then you give them their exercises and their feedback and what have you throughout the session. And then at the end of the session, so what, what we focused on tonight was power down into the ground. Last week, we focused on arms, if you remember. This week, we focused on power down. So tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. Repetition is an incredibly important part of learning. Have I said that before? I think I might have. Repetition is an important part of learning. So tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you told them. Just remind them what they're learning, and it helps it stay in their, um, in their memories. So that's our process of learning. So just take, again, you know, I don't want to overwhelm you with this. What I want you to do is just take away, okay, what from here could I take away and do more of or do better with um, in terms of my approach to coaching? So second thing, so we talked about the process of learning. I now I just want a couple of little tips on the language that we use um, when we're talking about learning. And I want us to focus on improvement as the goal, not perfection. We're not, these kids are not, they're not, none of them are going to be perfect. And focus on the behaviour, not the person. So um, let me just say a little bit about both of those things. Okay, so the second topic to do with learning that I, I'm going to present a couple of ideas around is the language to use, especially when it comes to praise. And what I want to suggest is that we focus our praise on improvement, not perfection. So when we're... <laughs> there, are, there are two extremes, I guess, that I would like us to avoid if we can. One is where, where kids only get praised when they do it perfectly. Praise is a hugely important part of encouragement, and the kids will be looking to you for that. So um, we, we need to give it. It's an important thing that coaches do. I used to have a coach, and in fact, one of the, one of the coaches who will be watching this still has that coach, <laughs> who pretty much never gave praise. If this guy, who's, who's a Greek guy, by the name of Tony, if he ever said to you, which he very, very occasionally did, very good, you knew you'd hit it out of the ballpark. You, you just like, oh, I've just completely nailed it there because he said very good. Because 99% of the time, he didn't say anything good. He didn't tell you even if you did it right the way that he asked you to do. It was just no praise whatsoever. And... Now that, you know, as an adult and a, and a reasonably well-developed one, I didn't need praise for, um, for, you know, to feel good about myself um, or to keep going. But it is encouraging. It's energising. And so it was just more that he missed out on an opportunity to add to my motivation and my energy. Um, but with little kids, you know, they might need it more than that. So we do need to, to give some praise. What I want to suggest is that we praise, you know, um, as, we, as we get closer to perfection, it's that movement, that, that improvement that we praise. Um, so, you know, that was so much better than the last one. In fact, I heard one of the coaches, Dave, um, just last week, say almost those exactly, exact words to one of his coachees. He said, that was, that was so much better than the last one. 
Um, so praise improvement, not perfection. And then secondly, the other end of the scale, we also want to avoid, which is the over the top kind of everything's awesome. Everything's wonderful. Everything's brilliant. If you do that, your praise is going to wear off and it will become a case that if the coach doesn't say I'm brilliant or I'm awesome, then I've done bad. So you, you, you wear off the power of your praise if you give too much all the time about everything. So um, make it genuine. So if it was, if the truth is it wasn't very good, but it was better than the last time, genuine praise is better. That's so much better. That was way better than last time versus awesome, right? Or another genuine one might be that's the best one so far. Well done. So not no praise and not unearned praise. Make it genuine and make it about improvements and progress. Um, right, so speaking of praise, um, just a few tips on the language to, to use. And my key point on this is focus on the behaviour, not on the person. So, for example, good work, well done, not good boy, good girl. And I hear some coaches, there's one especially that I can think of that I, who's constantly saying, good boy, good girl, and I just think you, you're, you're setting up a disaster here. And the reason is... If my worthiness, my goodness or otherwise, as a person, and, and I would even say veer away from gender-based language as much as you can, there's absolutely no reason to use it unless you're saying, you know, in a girl's event you need to, you know, the standard is or the rules are or whatever versus boys, okay, then it's relevant. Other than that, they're athletes. They're not, or they're kids. They're not boys and girls. Um, but as much as possible, Focus on the behaviour um, so that if they aren't doing well, it doesn't mean they're not a good person. Like not doing well, failing, making mistakes are absolutely critical to learning and we need to be really okay with them. Um, and in fact, sometimes a kid tries something, they get it completely wrong. Really good effort. I can see you really tried to do that. It didn't, it didn't feel good, did it? It didn't feel natural, it didn't flow very well, it felt hard or tricky or clumsy or whatever. But the fact that you had that you had that attempt, you 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 did it even though it didn't feel good, really good. Okay, so we want to get them away from if I do well I'm a good person. If I do badly I'm not a good person. I'm a bad person. So that's why focusing on behaviour rather than, you know, good boy, good girl is really important. Um, if you're correcting or, or saying, you know, you want something different, what I saw was, rather than what you did was, it makes it sound, in, a lot of the time what the kid did wasn't intentional. They just had a go. So try and, again, keep it focused on the behaviour so they can almost see their own behaviour. So what I saw was uh, the hands weren't quite going all the way from hip to lip that time. And what we want is hip to lip all the way those elbows driving back. Um, so even saying what you did was had low arms and what I want you to do is have bigger arms, again, it makes it really personal. And the more personal feedback is, the harder it is to change. If it's just a behaviour, it's something I can change easily. If it's just an action, it's something I can change easily. So as much as possible, keep it focused on what I saw, what we want, good work, well done, um, and be specific as you, you know along the way. So what you what you di what you did was uh, sorry what you blah, 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 blah. Uh, you ran that bend to the high jump that that lean on your run was really good. Lock that in. We want that every time. So specific and focused on a behaviour. Now this applies also with the good stuff. Um, so as a, the example I just gave where a kid did something right, um, but also about stuff that might 
you know, you might be tempted to think, oh, but that's that's a personal characteristic. So what if a kid, for example, I had a, a young hurdler last season fall over over one of the hurdles, um, and and you know she was a bit flustered and shocked, and then we had a few tears. Um, but instead of saying you're really brave, because she got up and, and you know then was willing to go back to the start line and have another go. So I wanted to praise that, you know, that brave behaviour. But what I said to her was, um, that's really good bravery, right? That's to be a good athlete, we need to be able to um, do brave things. You know, when it's hard or when it's scary or if we, you know, fall over, we we have to be able to get up and and do. You know, go back and have another go. So really, really good. Um, versus you're such a brave girl. Because there might be times when she can't be brave. Um, and then she's put in this real tense situation where, but she told me I'm a brave girl before and now I'm going to let her down and, you know, what have you. We're all brave in certain circumstances and we're not brave in other circumstances. And we need to be able to make, you know, the way they're feeling at the time, okay. So even with the good stuff, even with stuff which might sound like, you know, personal traits or personal characteristics, focus on the behaviour. You know, getting up after you've fallen over that hurdle and going back and having another go, that's excellent. That's what that's what athletes who are going to learn and do well, that's what they do. So good work. Now, one thing you might or might not have noticed as I was giving these examples is my intonation. So oftentimes, especially us Aussies, we tend to, our intonation goes up. So really good. That was really good. If you want to give something impact, and so this is especially true in positive feedback because you'll often find that in positive feedback, send the intonation down. That was really good versus that was really good. But that sounds more like a question, more like it's maybe you're not really entirely sure of it and maybe there's something else that's coming that's going to qualify what I just said. If you send that in, if you want to give a strong positive message, send the intonation down. Right? The run into that high jump bar was excellent. Your posture in that, in that rep was spot on. So intonation down. So just to recap, we had a look at the process of learning, and now we're talking about the language of learning. We're, we've covered focusing on improvement as what we pay attention to and praise rather than perfection, and we're focusing on the behaviour, not the person. Okay, so that's all the input I'm going to give you now. Again, as I say, I don't expect you to remember all of that. I want you as a coach, depending on you know, what you're already doing or what you think might be make the most difference to the way that you coach, you know, choose your one thing. What are you going to try and do more of, less of, or differently um, when you go out to coach next week? Um, so those who are only B&B coaches, so only the Winston Art coaches, um, if you like, you can tune out now because um, I, I just have a little bit to say to the people who are turning up for the Wednesday coaching, uh, sorry, Monday coaching, for the technical coaching. Um, so thank you for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. Um, you may depart. For my technical training coaches, I just want to say a couple of things about the first night. So if you wouldn't mind arriving at least 10 minutes early, make sure you've got your equipment ready. Um, we also, some of us need to meet each other. I haven't even met you all yet in person. So, and to meet each other would be good. I've got a couple of things I need to give you. I'm going to do a quick introduction um, to everyone, the parents and the athletes and everybody, just giving them a feel for what we're doing and why. I'd also like to introduce each of you. Um, I'll give them a rundown of what's going to happen. So the, the warm up, which will be the weekly start um, to do the warm up laps and for two laps, I'm going to have little signs out around the track telling them what to do so that those who don't listen can still do it. Um, and then, so they'll do their two laps and then they'll go to you. Um, for another five or ten minutes of event-specific warm-ups, so you need to have those ready for them. Um, and I will have in your little coach packs um, name tags for the first session. Um, I, obviously, before the night, you'll have your list of um, the names of people in your group, and then I'll have some spare 
um, stickers in your coach pack so that if you want to do names again on the second week, um, because you haven't quite got them all um, permanently (laughs) embedded in your memories, um, you can do that if, if you wish. So that's it from me for now. I hope this has been helpful to you in some way. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate um, to ask. And I really look forward to trying this experiment with you and hopefully we'll see some, some better outcomes um, with the kids and some more satisfaction for the coaches when you see your kids actually learning something from week to week and hopefully we'll have a lot of fun. So that's it from me and I'll see you at the track.